Last week, Jonathan Majors was given the date of August 3rd for his domestic violence trial. He was initially arrested in late March of this year after his then-girlfriend reported to police that he had hit, strangled, and otherwise abused her. Since the news hit about these allegations, rumors have been flying about Majors possibly being dropped by Marvel after he was swiftly dropped by the U.S. Army's latest ad campaign, as well as his PR and management teams and other projects as well. But Major's legal team is saying that not only is it not true and provable with clear evidence, but this is a result of racist New York police officers baiting information out of a young white woman against a tall black man. In this video, we're going into all of the facts that are available to the public to investigate. And at the end, I want to know what you think. Is this a racist hoax or do you think that he actually abused his now ex-girlfriend? Let's get into it. So let's start with Jonathan Majors. Who is he? Jonathan Majors is an American actor from Lompoc, California, whose career in recent years has been characterized as not only on the rise, but most recently exploding. If you recognize him, you might know him from his roles in the TV series Lovecraft County or films like White Boy Rick, The Last Black Man in San Francisco, Devotion, or as the Marvel supervillain King the Conqueror in Marvel's Loki and Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Or if you're not much of a movie buff, maybe you saw him in the US Army's most recent recruitment ad campaign. Here's a personal question for you. When you look into your future, do you see a life full of obstacles or possibilities? To those who follow these types of campaigns, maybe you're in a military family like I am, you might know that this particular campaign was actually met with quite a bit of praise, unlike other recent campaigns that were met with controversy for taking more of a political bent. I remember telling Mr. Bites when the ad initially came out that the army was both very fortunate and very smart to have gotten in the quote unquote ground floor with Jonathan Majors considering the rise of his career in recent years. I mean, it looked like it was going parabolically upward. As it turns out though, this was just days before all of that came to a screeching halt. Now in a second, we're gonna get into what exactly happened. But first, I have to thank this video sponsor. This video is sponsored by MD Hair. So I'm generally pretty lazy about my hair, but I am all for finding a product that is going to help make it fuller, stronger, and healthier. Enter MD Hair, a brand that is geared towards men and women. MD Hair is the world's first medical grade hair growth treatment customized to the exact cause and type of hair loss. Because whether or not you're dealing with a hair loss problem, you are in fact losing hair. I I mean, I shed all the time, probably just as much as the pets. <laughs> anyway, this is a clinically proven customized hair growth treatment that is developed by dermatologists. How do they customize it, you ask? Well, you go through a quiz to talk about your hair situation and you send in a photo of your scalp. And MD Hair then uses their AI technology to analyze all of that data and to come up with a customized treatment kit according to your needs. It consists of shampoo, conditioner, serum, and supplements so that it can work on the issue from inside out. I use these products and I can say that the shampoo and conditioner smells very nice. My hair feels smoother, softer, healthier, and the volume is great. And today, if you follow the link in the description below, you will get a 70% discount off of the first monthly kit with full-size products. So if you're interested, click on the link in the description below to get your discount. And thank you to MD Hair for sponsoring this video. Okay, so what happened here to bring his seemingly meteoric rise in Hollywood to a total screen? halt. On March 25th, 2023, TMZ broke the news that Jonathan Majors was arrested on charges of domestic violence against his then girlfriend, who was at the time not named, but later revealed to be Grace Jabari. According to the claim, it happened when they were sitting in the backseat of a privately hired car in New York City the previous night. A text from another woman allegedly popped up on his phone and she confronted him, wanting to see what it was about. She claims Majors got mad and that he allegedly grabbed her hand, slapped her, and put his hands around her neck. According to TMZ, she reported that after the the argument she was dropped off somewhere and that Majors spent the night elsewhere. The next morning, police were called to Majors' apartment, where both of them were, and they concluded the visit by arresting Majors on suspicion of domestic violence. And again, according to reporting, she had visible injuries, including a laceration behind her ear, a broken finger on her right hand, and redness and marks to her face, which were presumed or assumed to be results of this alleged altercation. She was taken to a hospital, and he was taken right to jail. The very next day, his legal 
legal team fired back, releasing a statement saying that they had clear evidence that he did not, in fact, abuse his ex-girlfriend. In support, they pointed to the fact that Majors was the one who called 911 in the first place. They also referenced surveillance video footage from the car they were in, as well as a witness statement from the driver, which purport to corroborate Majors' side. They also referenced other surveillance footage that they said supported Majors, and they said that they had text messages between Majors and the ex-girlfriend where she even recanted the abuse claim. Now, let's first go over the text message exchange. These are the texts that his legal team provided to TMZ on March 30th, 2023. Here you can see in the blue bubble on the right, that would be Jonathan Major's side, and on the left in gray, that would be from Ms. Jabari. So you can see that Major says, did you leave the keys? Goodbye, and her name is redacted. Then later the same day, she responds, please let me know you're okay when you get this. They assured me that you won't be charged. They said they had to arrest you as protocol when they saw the injuries on me, and they knew we had a fight. I'm so angry that they did, and I'm sorry you're in this position. We'll make sure nothing happens about this. I told them it was my fault for trying to grab your phone. I only just got out of hospital. Just call me when you're out. I love you. And then later she continues, they just called again to check on me and I reiterated how this was not an attack and they do not have my blessing on any charges being placed. I read the paper they gave me about strangulation and I said point blank, this did not occur and should be removed immediately. The judge is definitely going to be told about this. She ensured this to me. I know you have the best team and there's nothing to worry about. I just want you to know that I'm doing all I can on my end. I also said to tell the judge to know that the origin of the call was to do with me collapsing and passing out and your worry as my partner due to our communication prior. Out of care, she promised all will be relayed. Now, when those text messages were published, people did not exactly come unanimously to Major's side in this issue in the way that I think his legal team and PR team had hoped. And that's primarily because of this sentence. I told them it was my fault for trying to grab your phone. I have to be honest here. This doesn't exactly sound like she's saying, I independently did this to myself and you did not touch me wrongly in any of this. Rather, to those that are a little bit familiar with abuse dynamics, this sentence can also be construed as saying, I asked to get hit because I did something that the other person didn't want me to do. So although on their own, these text messages don't exactly prove that Jonathan Majors did in fact abuse his ex-girlfriend, they don't exactly help him either. In the litigation context, I can see how these would be very helpful because they could be used to impeach her if she later says something completely different. However, in terms of believability in the court of public opinion, opinion, it's not really that helpful. And the problem is before these texts were published, Major's legal team made it seem like these were black and white exonerative text messages as if they were going to be definitively proving that even the alleged victim says it didn't happen the way that the police said it happened. When an expectation like that has been set and then subsequently not met when the cards are actually on the table, it kind of feels a little bit like spin. And that doesn't really help Majors in the court of public opinion because the public really can typically sniff that out. But but what about the driver who was there when this alleged incident actually happened? And what about the surveillance footage from the car that they say exists, as well as from the club later that night that they say that she visited afterwards, as well as the police body camera footage from the next day? Now, that's where things start to look a little bit better for majors. And arguably, that's where either side would really need to win it. And that's because juries, whether we are talking in the court of public opinion or in a court of law, are generally speaking going to try trust surveillance footage and photo evidence more than witness testimony because they can see for themselves what actually happened in a lot of circumstances. So what do we actually know about the video surveillance footage from this instance? Let's go through each of them one by one. The first is the car footage, as well as the witness statement from the driver who Major's legal team says is actually ready to testify on Major's behalf. According to the New York Post and others, Major's attorney Priya Chaudhry said that the driver reported a woman, quote, hitting, scratching, and attacking Majors, and that Majors asked the driver to stop so he could escape the violence from her. Majors' legal team says that they have video footage from this actual incident, but it still has yet to be released to the public. So just how much it actually supports his case, we don't know for ourselves just yet. But if it does corroborate what it seems that this witness is saying actually happened, then it's game over. Could abuse have happened elsewhere in their relationship? Theoretically, yes, but that's not what's alleged here in this case. The alleged altercation happened in that car on that night, so if there's proof that it didn't happen then and there, then that's the end of this claim. Okay, so that's talking about the car footage. 
What about the club footage? According to Major's legal team, they say her claims don't add up because later that same night, she went out to clubs in New York City. Now, as a foundational matter, and looking at this from a devil's advocate perspective, having looked at a number of cases with abuse claims, I can tell you that sometimes victims don't really do things that most people would say would make sense or is logical. Despite that, there still has to be some level of explainability around it in order to fit that into the overall narrative or the overall landscape of facts. And Looking at this from another perspective, I could see how someone could be roughed up by their partner one night and then decide to go out to either shake it off or to somehow self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. This can be particularly true if the abuse victim also has a substance abuse problem. After all, people with addictions to drugs and alcohol are arguably more susceptible to ending up in abusive relationships than those who aren't in the grips of addiction. That said, Major's legal team also says that in the club surveillance videos, Jabari is seen casually pushing her hair behind her right ear, reaching into her bag several times, sorting through credit cards, handling phones, holding a menu, and easily holding a glass of champagne. If the video surveillance footage actually holds up to that description, that is another huge blow to the prosecution's case here. It suggests that either she was never injured at all, or if she did get injured, that those injuries were sustained long after this altercation ever ended. So what do we have available to us of this footage? We don't have the actual video footage, but we we do have stills that were taken from that footage and attached to filings submitted by Major's legal team to the New York County Criminal Court. Here's one image where she's either receiving or handing off something to what appears to be the DJ at the club. From looking at it, I can't really tell if it's a drink or money or something else, but it does appear that she's using her right hand. Not being able to see the movement, it's hard to gauge how much difficulty she's having with this exchange. And it is possible that she could be using her right hand because it's her dominant hand and she's just so used to using it by default, but that with an injury, she's having a hard time doing things she normally could do with ease. But she is using it so she could be uninjured. It would be a lot easier to determine just how much this actually helps Major's case if we could see the actual video of it. So hopefully that gets released sooner rather than later. Now, here's another image of her at the club that night, apparently using her cell phone with her right hand. Again, this suggests her hand is uninjured, but I really wanna see how easily she's manipulating the phone or if she's having a hard time doing it. And right now, all we really have are Major's legal team's characterization of these movements, which is not the same thing as seeing it for ourselves. Now, we also have Major's lawyer's arguments about the morning that the police arrived. They are saying that Major's arrest was a result of racism on the part of the police who responded to the 911 call. In support, they point to the fact that the police apparently didn't recognize Major's despite his recent Hollywood successes, and they allegedly commented on how someone like Major's could afford such a luxurious New York City apartment. His legal team also says that the body cam footage from the police shows that they were clearly coaching her to say that Majors grabbed her by the throat. They've said that this includes footage of Jabari saying, I don't remember what happened, something like 19 times until finally the police asked her again and then she gave her narrative. But again, all we have here are stills from the body cam footage. The public has not been able to see portions of the actual footage itself. The police might be doing what let's say they've been trained to do for domestic violence cases and drawing out information from an abuse victim or an alleged abuse victim. Or they might be improperly coaching someone to make up a claim against her then boyfriend because of the fact that they themselves have already made up several assumptions about this other man. Either one is a possibility because it's a very fact-specific and nuanced issue that could be one way or another. So if you're looking at this objectively, it's really tough to look at what's actually available to us and come to any definitive conclusion without relying on the characterizations that were given to the public by Major's legal team. But what even led to the police arriving that morning in the first place? This is the final core argument by Major's lawyers. It seems to be undisputed that he's the one who actually called the police that morning when he arrived at the apartment around 11 a.m. to find her sleeping half naked on the floor of his walk-in closet after allegedly throwing up on the bed. According to Majors, Jabari told him that she had taken, quote, a few sleeping tablets before then. In my personal opinion, I do think this weighs somewhat in favor of Majors. But looking at arguments going against this assessment, some people have pointed out that years ago, Amber Heard called the police on Johnny Depp, claiming he had just violently abused her and torn up the apartment. Those of us who watched the trial are, by and large, convinced that that is not what actually happened that night. So this is meant to show that it is, in fact, possible for someone to falsely and fraudulently call the police to make an incorrect appearance that they have actually been victimized by someone else. And what about Brian Laundrie, who positioned himself 
himself as so friendly, so cooperative, so helpful to the police when they pulled him and his girlfriend Gabby Petito over in Moab, Utah, while on their road trip across the United States. The police determined that Gabby, who admitted to hitting Brian, was the aggressor in that situation and separated them both for the night. And this was infamously followed later by discovery of her remains in Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming after Brian killed her, as apparently confirmed in writings he left behind before his remains were found in the Florida wilderness. All of that is to say that, yes, abusers can definitely fool the police by calling the police to make themselves look like a victim or by appearing very cooperative to cover up the fact that they're the ones who were actually causing harm to the other person in the situation. But to figure out whether or not that would be likely in this particular case, we have to look at the likelihood that Majors subjectively would be thinking that he could be successful in that endeavor. Keep in mind that despite his fame, despite his wealth, despite his success, he is a black man making the decision to invite the police into his home for one reason or another. Regardless of what you think about the police, we are talking about his subjective mental state and making that call to 911. And to do that, we have to consider the idea that a lot of black men are in fact concern today about interactions with the police. Whatever your or my thoughts are on the police, we can probably all agree that this has been a subject that's been at the forefront of our collective consciousness over the last few years. And I don't know much about his personal history on this particular subject, but it is entirely possible that he may not have had some great interactions with the police in the past. Or even if he hasn't had much personal interaction with the police, he could have been greatly affected by things like the Black Lives Matter movement, the conversations around George Floyd that have been all over social media and the regular media in recent years. So considering all of that and looking at this from basically a statistical likelihood standpoint, it doesn't seem that likely to me personally that he would be that particularly confident in the ability to like trick the police into arresting his alleged abuse victim by putting on some kind of like Brian Laundry like moves. Now, since all of this has come out, the Army has pulled all of the ads Majors was featured in, and rumors have run abound about Majors possibly being dropped from his role as King the Conqueror in the next Marvel project. He also reportedly decided to forego this year's Met Gala after previous plans to appear alongside designer Valentino. And he's been dropped by his PR representatives at the lead company and by his management team at Entertainment 360. So in the wake of this controversy, Majors really has gone from one of the hottest breakout stars in Hollywood to basically a social pariah. And regardless of your opinions of what actually happened here, you have to admit that this has been pretty swift action. So now that you've heard all of this, I do want to talk about a concept that I've talked about on this channel before, and that's the truth default theory. Now, because I have talked about it before, I won't get into too much detail, but if you are wanting more on it, I will link to my prior video where I do go into greater depth on it in the description below. But I will say that this is a theory that is credited to the psychologist Timothy Levine. Basically, he conducted a bunch of studies which revealed to him that humans have a tendency to default to truth. What do I mean by that? I mean that in our everyday lives, when we encounter someone and that person tells us something, anything, we generally assume that that person is telling us the truth. And if we do question it, we tend to ask ourselves, why would this person lie? As opposed to, for example, why would this person tell us the truth? In my opinion, this also comes into play quite a bit when we hear allegations in the news as well. News breaks about some prominent actor, for example, doing something terrible, and the reaction from many will be, oh, that's so unfortunate, I really liked that actor. And because of that, it usually takes a lot of time, energy, effort, evidence in order for that, let's say, social defendant to overcome that allegation in the minds of the jury of the court of public opinion. Think of these as red flags in the narrative. These red flags consist of things that are basically inconsistencies or things that don't add up. But according to the truth default theory, overcoming that truth default inertia isn't possible just by the appearance of red flags. There have to be enough red flags in order to convince someone that the person making that allegation was lying. And this is important because in a court of law, there's a complete different standard. Instead, the jury has to consider you innocent until proven guilty. So keep that in mind as this story continues to develop. And with that, what do you think? 
Are there enough red flags here in order to consider this a hoax situation? Or do you think that there's a strong possibility that Jonathan Majors did in fact abuse his ex-girlfriend? I probably should have mentioned earlier in this video that the prosecution is allegedly talking to other ex-girlfriends of his to see if any of them were abused as well, according to their narrative. But nothing has been presented to the public confirming that any of these exes actually did in fact say that they were abused by Jonathan Majors. For my part, I personally don't like the way that those text messages between Majors and Jabari look, but I do admit that those images of her at the club do raise some suspicions, at the very least introduce questions that should be asked and investigated fully. So my personal uneasiness with those text messages can totally be overcome if the video surveillance footage and the witness statement from the driver all corroborate Majors' side. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it interesting or informative. And if you did, I would love it if you could hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you're new here and you want to see more stuff like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded. See you in the next one.